Hey guys, sorry it's been a minute since uh, the last reading. Obviously I went on vacation and then I forgot to take the book with me, which I was going to take with to do some other recordings, but you know what? It's fine. We're back now and let's continue on in Small Gods. Like I said, we're very close to the end. Um, I'd say probably two, maybe three more readings, depending on how long I want to read for. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for coming with me through this journey. Um, the next one I'll do is probably going to be um, either Reaper Man or Hogfather. Maybe I'll put up a vote for that later. I don't know. We'll see. Anyways. <clears throat> the fighting was over in a Feeb. It hadn't lasted long, especially when the slaves joined in. There were too many narrow streets, too many ambushes, and above all, too much terrible determination. It's generally held that free men will always triumph over slaves, but perhaps it all depends on your point of view. Besides, the Ephibian garrison commander had declared somewhat nervously that slavery would henceforth be abolished, which infuriated the slaves. What would be the point of saving up to become free if you couldn't own slaves afterwards? Besides, how'd they eat? The Omnians couldn't understand, and uncertain people fight badly. And Vorbis had gone. Certainty seemed less certain when those eyes were elsewhere. The tyrant was released from his prison. He spent his first day of freedom carefully composing messages to other small countries along the coast. It was time to do something about Omnia. Bruthus sang. His voice echoed off the rocks. Flocks of scalbies shook off their lazy pedestrian habits and took off frantically, leaving feathers behind in their rush to get airborne. Snakes wriggled into cracks in the stone. You could live in the desert, or at least survive. Getting back to Omnia can only be a matter of time. One more day. Vorbis trooped along a little behind him. He said nothing, and when spoken to, gave no sign that he had understood what had been said to him. Um, bumping along in Brutha's pack, began to feel the acute depression that steals over every realist in the presence of an optimist. The strained strains of claws of iron shall rend the ungodly faded away. There was a small rock slide. Some ways off. We're alive, said Brutha. For now. And we're close to home. Yes? I saw a wild goat on the rocks back there. Ah, there's still a lot of them about. Goats? Ugh, gods. And the ones we had back there were the puny ones, mind you. But what do you mean? Ohm sighed. It's reasonable, isn't it? Think about it. The stronger ones hang around on the edge where there's prey. I mean people. The weak ones get pushed out to the sandy places where people hardly ever go. The strong gods, said Brutha thoughtfully. Gods that know about being strong. That's right. Not gods that know what it feels like to be weak. What? They wouldn't last five minutes. It's a god-eat-god -god world. Perhaps that explains something about the nature of gods. Strength is hereditary, like sin. His face clouded. Except that it isn't? Sin, I mean. I think... Perhaps, when we get back, I shall talk to some people. Oh, and they'll listen, will they? Wisdom comes out of the wilderness, they say. Only the wisdom that people want, and mushrooms. When the sun was starting to climb, Brutha milked a goat. It stood patiently while Ohm soothed its mind. And Ohm didn't suggest killing it, Brutha noticed. They found shade again. There were bushes here, low-growing spiky, every tiny leaf barricaded behind its crown of thorns. Ohm watched for a while, but the small gods on the edge of the wilderness were more cunning and less urgent. They'd be here, probably at noon, when the sun turned the landscape into a hellish glare. He'd hear them. In the meantime, he could eat. He crawled through the bushes, their thorns scraping harmlessly along his shell. He passed another tortoise, which wasn't inhabited by a god, and gave him that vague stare that tortoises employ when they're deciding whether something is there to be eaten or made love to which are the only things on a normal tortoise mind. He avoided it and found a couple of leaves it had missed. Periodically, he'd stomp back through the gritty soil and watch the sleepers. And then he saw Vorbis sit up, look around him in a slow, methodical way, pick up a stone, study it carefully, and bring it down sharply on Brutha's head. Brutha didn't even groan. Vorbis got up and strode directly towards the bushes that hid Om. He tore the branches aside, regardless of the thorns, and pulled out the tortoise Ohm had just met. For a moment, it was held up, legs moving slowly, before the deacon threw it 
overarm into the rocks. Then he picked up Brutha with some effort, slung him across his shoulders, and set off towards Omnia. It happened in seconds. Om fought to stop his head and legs retracting automatically into his shell, a tortoise's instinctive panic reaction. Vorbis was already disappearing around some rocks. He disappeared. Om started to move forward and then ducked into his shell as a shadow skimmed over the ground. It was a familiar shadow, and one filled with tortoise dread. The eagle swept down towards the spot where the stricken tortoise was struggling and, with barely a pause in the stoop, snatched the reptile and soared back into the sky with a long, lazy sweeps of its wings. Om watched it until it became a dot, and then looked away as a smaller dot detached itself from and tumbled below over and over towards the rocks. The eagle descended slowly, preparing to feed. A breeze rattled the thorn bushes and stirred the sand. Om thought he could hear the taunting, mocking voices of all the small gods. Saint Undulant, on his bony knees, smashed open the hard, swollen leaf of a stone plant. Nice lad, he thought. Talked to himself a lot, but that was only to be expected. The desert took some people like that, didn't it, Angus? Yes, said Angus. Angus didn't want any of the brackish water. He said it gave him wind. Eh, please yourself, said Saint Undulant. Well, well, here's a little treat. You don't often get Chilipoda Ar Aridius out here in the open desert, and here with three, all under one rock. Funny how you felt like a little nibble even after the good meal of petite pork roti avec pommes de terre novelles les legumes du jour et bière glacé avec figment de l'imagination. Oh, God, that's... Sorry, that was a lot of French, I think. But also uh, saying that all of it's a figment of his imagination, if you couldn't tell. <clears throat> he was picking the legs of the second one out of his tooth when the lion padded up to the top of the nearest dune behind him. The lion was feeling an odd sensation of gratitude. It felt it should catch up with the nice food that attended to it and, well, refrain from eating it in some symbolic way. And now here was some more food hardly paying attention. Well, it didn't owe this one anything. It padded forward, then lumbered up into a run. Oblivious to his fate, St. Undulant started on the third centipede. The lion leapt, and things would have looked very bad for St. Undulant if Angus hadn't caught it right behind the ear with a rock. Brutha was standing in the desert, except that the sand was as black as the sky and there was no sun, although everything was brilliantly lit. Ah, he thought, so this is dreaming. There were thousands of people walking across the desert. They paid him no attention. They walked as if completely unaware that they were in the middle of a crowd. He tried to wave at them, but he was nailed to the spot. He tried to speak, and the words evaporated in his mouth. And then he woke up. The first thing he saw was the light slanting through a window. Against the light was a pair of hands raised in the sign of the Holy Horns. With some difficulty, his head screaming pain at him, Brutha followed the hands along a pair of arms to where they joined not far under the bowed head of Brother Numrod. The Master of Novices looked up. Brutha? Yes? Um, be praised! Brutha craned his neck to look around. Is he here? Here. How do you feel? I... His head ached, his back felt as though it was on fire, and there was a dull pain in his knees. You were very badly sunburned, said Numrod. And that was a nasty knock on the head you had in the fall. W what fall? Fall? From the desert! In the desert! You were with the Prophet, said Numrod. You walked with the Prophet, one of my novices! I remember the desert, said Brutha, touching his head gingerly. But... The prophet? Prophet? People are saying you could be made a bishop or even an eum, said Numrod. There's a precedent, you know. The most holy saint Bobby was made a bishop because he was in a desert with the prophet Ossery, and he was a donkey. But I don't remember any prophet. There was just me and... Rutha stopped. Numrod was beaming. Vorbis? He most graciously told me all about it, said Numrod. 
I was privileged to be in the place of lamentation when he arrived. It was just after the Sistine prayers. The Cenobiarch was just departing. Well, you know the ceremony. And there was Vorbis, covered in dust and leading a donkey. I'm afraid you were across the back of the donkey. I don't remember a donkey, said Brutha. Donkey? He picked it up at one of the farms. There was quite a crowd with him. Numrod was flushed with excitement. And he declared a month of... Jadra and double penances, and the council has given him the staff and the halter, and the Cenobiach has gone off to the Hermitage and scant. Vorbis is the eighth prophet, said Brutha. Prophet, of course. And was there a tortoise? Has he mentioned anything about a tortoise? Tortoise? What have tortoises got to do with anything? Numrod's expression softened. But, of course, the prophet said the sun had affected you. He said you were raving, hey, excuse me, about all sorts of strange things. He did? He sat by your bed for three days. It was inspiring. How long since we came back? Back? Almost a week. A week! Brutha stared at the wall. And he left orders that you were to be brought to him as soon as you were fully conscious, said Numrod. He was very definite about that. His tone of voice suggested he wasn't quite sure of Brutha's state of consciousness even now. Do you think you can walk? I can get some novices to carry you if you prefer. I have to go and see him now. Now, right away. I'll expect you want to thank him. Brutha had known about these parts of the Citadel only by hearsay. Brother Numrod had never seen them either. Although he had never been specifically included in the summons, he had come nevertheless fussing importantly around Brutha as two sturdy novices carried him in a kind of sedan chair normally used by the more crumblings of the senior clerics. In the center of the citadel behind the temple was a walled garden. Brutha looked at it with an expert eye. There wasn't an inch of natural soil on the bare rock. Every spadeful that these shady trees grew in must have been carried up by hand. Vorbis was there, surrounded by bishops and iams. Or eams. I'm not quite sure. I'm sorry, I'm not a religious person. <clears throat> he looked around as Brutha approached. Oh, my desert companion, he said amiably. And Brother Numrod, I believe. My brothers, I should like you to know that I have it in mind to raise our Brutha to archbishophood. There was a faint murmur of astonishment from the clerics, and then a clearing of a throat. Vorbis looked down at Bishop Treem, who was the Citadel's archivist. Well, technically, he's not even uh, yet even ordained, said Bishop Treem doubtfully. Uh, but of course, we all know there has been a precedent. Ossery's ass, said Brother Numrod promptly. He put his hand over his mouth and went red with shame and embarrassment. Vorbis smiled. Good Brother Numrod is correct, he said who had also not been ordained unless the qualifications were somewhat relaxed in those days. There was a chorus of nervous laughs, such as there always is from people who owe their jobs and possibly their lives to a whim of the person who has just cracked the not very amusing line. Although the donkey was only made a bishop, said Bishop's death wish treme, a role for which it would Highly qualified, said Vorbis sharply, and now you will all leave, including subdeacon Numrod, he added. Numrod went from red to white at this sudden preferment, but Archbishop Brutha will remain. We wish to talk. The clergy withdrew. Vorbis sat down on a stone chair under an elder tree. It was huge and ancient, quite unlocked unlike its short-lived relatives outside the garden, and its berries were ripening. The prophet sat with his elbows on the stone arms of the chair, his hands interlocked in front of him, and gave Brutha a long, slow stare. You are... recovered? he said, eventually. Uh, yes, Lord, said Brutha. But Lord, I cannot be a bishop. I cannot even... I assure you the job does not require much intelligence, said Vorbis. If it did, bishops would not be able to do it. There was another long silence. When Vorbis next spoke, it was as if every word was being winched up from a great depth. We spoke once, did we not, of the nature of reality? Uh, yes, and how often what is perceived is not that which is fundamentally true. Yes. Another pause. 
High overhead, an eagle circled, looking for tortoises. I am sure you have confused memories of our wanderings in the wilderness. No. It is only to be expected, the sun, the thirst, the hunger. Uh, no, Lord, my memory does not confuse readily. Oh, yes, I recall. So do I, Lord. Vorbis turned his head slightly, looking sidelong at Brutha as if he was trying to hide behind his own face. In the desert, the great god Ulm spoke to me. Uh, yes, Lord, he did, every day. You have a mighty, if simple, faith, Brutha. When it comes to people, I am a great judge. Uh, yes, Lord. Lord? Yes, my Brutha? Numrod said that you led me through the desert, Lord. Remember what I said about fundamental truth, Brutha? Of course you do. There was a physical desert indeed, but, I al but also a desert of the soul. My god led me, and I led you. Ah, uh, yes, I see. Overhead, the spiraling dot that was the eagle appeared to hang motionless in the air for a moment. Then it folded its wings and fell. Much was given to me in the desert, Brutha. Much was learned. Now I must tell the world. That is the duty of a prophet, to go where others have not been and bring back the truth of it. Faster than the wind, its whole bo brain and body existing only as a mist around the sheer intensity of its purpose. I did not expect it to be this soon, but Ohm guided my steps, and now that we have the Cinebiarchy, we shall make use of it. Somewhere out in the hillside, the eagle swooped, picked something up, and strove for height. I'm just a novice, Lord Vorbis. I am not a bishop, even if everyone calls me one. You will get used to it. It sometimes took a long time for an idea to form in Brutha's mind, but one was forming now. It was something about the way Vorbis was sitting, something about the edge in his voice. Vorbis was afraid of him. Why me? Because of the desert? Who would care? For all I know, it was always like this. Probably it was Osiris' ass that carried him in the wilderness, who found the water, who kicked the lion to death. Because of a Phoebe? Who would listen? Who would care? He's the prophet in the Cenobiart. He could have killed me just like that. Anything he does is right. Anything he says is true. Fundamentally true. I have something to show you that may amuse you, said Vorbis, standing up. Can you walk? Oh, yes. Numrod was just being kind. It's mainly sunburn. As they moved away, Brutha saw something he hadn't noticed before. There were members of the Holy Guard armed with bows in the garden. They were in the shade of trees, or amongst the bushes. Not too obvious, but not exactly hidden. Steps led away from the garden to a maze of underground tunnels and rooms that underlay the temple and, indeed, the whole of the citadel. Noiselessly, a couple of the guards fell in behind them at a respectful distance. Brutha followed Vorbis through the tunnels of the Artificer's Quarter, where forges and workshops cluster around in one wide, deep light well. Smoke and fumes billowed up around the hewn rock walls. Vorbis walked directly to a large alcove that glowed red with the light of the forge fires. Several workers were clustered around something wide and curved. There, said Vorbis. What do you think? It was a turtle. The iron founders had done a pretty good job, even down to the patterning on the shell and the scales on the legs. It was about eight feet long. Rutha heard a rushing noise in his ears as Vorbis spoke. They speak poisonous gibberish about turtles, do they not? They think they live on the back of a great turtle. Well, let them die on one. Now Brutha could see shackles attached to each iron leg. A man or a woman could with great discomfort lie spread eagled on the back of the turtle and be chained firmly at the wrists and ankles. He bent down. Yes, there was a firebox underneath. Some aspects of the Quisition thinking never changed. That much iron would take ages to heat up to the point of pain. Much time, therefore, to reflect on things. What do you think? said Vorbis. A vision of the future flashed across Brutha's mind. Ingenious, he said. 
And it will be a salutary lesson for all others tempted to stray from the path of true knowledge, said Vorbis. When do you, uh, intend to demonstrate it? I am sure an occasion will present itself, said Vorbis. When Brutha straightened up, Vorbis was staring at him so intently that it was as if he was reading Brutha thought, Brutha's thoughts off the back of his head. And now, please leave, said Vorbis. Rest as much as you can, my son. Brutha walked slowly across the place, deep in unaccustomed thought. Hmm. Afternoon, your reverence. You know already? Cut me own hand off de blah beamed over the top of his lukewarm, ice-cold sherbet stand. Heard it on the grapevine, he said. Here, have a slab of clatchy and delight, free, on a stick. The place was more crowded than usual. Even de blah's hotcakes were selling like hotcakes. Uh, busy today, said Brutha, hardly thinking about it. Time of the prophet, see, said Dublah, when the great god is manifest in the world. And if you think it's busy now, he won't be able to swing a goat in here in a few days' time. What happens then? You all right? You look a bit peaky. What happens then? The laws! You know, the Book of Orbis, I suppose. Dublah leaned forward towards Brutha. You wouldn't have a hint, would you? I suppose the great god didn't happen to say anything of benefit to the convenience food industry. I don't know. I think he'd like people to grow more lettuce. Uh, really? It's only a guess. The blog grinned evilly. Ah, yes, but it's your guess. A nod's as good as a poke with a sharp stick to a deaf camel, they say. I know where I can get my hands on a few acres of well-irrigated land, funnily enough. Perhaps I had to buy now, ahead of the crowd. Can't see any harm in it, Mr. Dublas. Dublas sidled closer. This was not hard. Dublas sidled everywhere. Crabs thought he walked sideways. Mm, funny thing, he said. I mean, Vorbis. Funny, said Brutha. Makes you think. Even Osri must have been a man who walked around just like you and me. Got wax in his ears, just like ordinary people. Funny thing. What is? And the whole thing! The blog gave Brutha another constipatorial... Oh, conspirat... Sorry. Constipated and conspiracies are two completely different things. Um, and then sold a footsore pilgrim a bowl of hummus that he would come to regret. Brutha wandered down to his dormitory. It was empty at this time of day, hanging around dormitories being discouraged in case of presence of rock-hard mattresses engendered thoughts of sin. His few possessions were gone from the shelf by his bunk. Probably he had a room of his own somewhere, although no one had told him. Brutha felt totally lost. He lay down on the bunk just in case and offered up a prayer to Alm. There was no reply. There had been no reply almost all of his life, and that hadn't been too bad because he'd never expected one. And before, there always been the comfort that perhaps Alm was listening and simply not deigning to say anything. Now, there was nothing to hear. He might as well be talking to himself and listening to himself. Like Vorbis. The thought wouldn't go away. Mind like a steel ball, Om had said. Nothing got in or out. So all Vorbis could hear were the distant echoes of his own soul. And out of the distant echoes, he would forge a book of Vorbis. And Brutha suspected he knew what the commandments would be. There would be talk of holy wars and blood and crusades and blood and piety and blood. Brutha got up, feeling like a fool, but the thoughts wouldn't go away. He was a bishop, but he didn't know what bishops did. He'd only seen them in the distance, drifting along like earthbound clouds. There was only one thing he knew he felt how to do. Some spotty boy was hoeing the vegetable garden. He looked at Brutha in amazement when he took the hoe and was stupid enough to hang on to it for a moment. I am a bishop, you know, said Brutha. Anyway, you aren't doing it right. Go and do something else. Brutha jabbed viciously at the weeds around the seedlings. Only a few weeks ago already, and there was a haze of green on the soil. You're a bishop for being good. And there's the iron turtle, in case you're bad, because... There were two people in the desert, and Alm spoke to one of them. It had never occurred to Brutha like that before. Alm had spoken to him. Admittedly, he hadn't said the things that the great prophets said he had. Perhaps he'd never said things like that. He worked his way to the end of the row. 
Then he tidied up the bean vines. Lut Z watched Bertha carefully from his little shed by the soil heaps. It was another barn. Ern was seeing a lot of barns. They'd started with a cart and invested a lot of time in reducing its weight as much as possible. Gearing had been a problem. He'd be doing a lot of thinking about gears. The ball wanted to spin much faster than the wheels wanted to turn. That was probably a metaphor for something or other. And I can't get it to go backwards, he said. <sighs> Don't worry, said Simony. It won't have to go backward. What about armor? Ern waved distractedly around the workshop. This is a village forge, he said. The thing is 20 feet long. Zacharos can't make plates bigger than a few feet across. I've tried nailing them on a framework, but it just collapses under the weight. Simony looked at the skeleton of the steam car and the pile of plates stacked next to it. Ever been in a battle, Ern? he said. No, I've got flat feet. I'm not very strong. Do you know what a tortoise is? Ern scratched his head. Okay, the answer isn't a little reptile in a shell, is it? Because you know I know that. I mean a shield tortoise. When you're attacking a fortress or a wall, and the enemy is dropping everything he's got on you. Every man holds his shield overhead so that it kind of slots into all the shields around it. It can take a lot of weight. Overlapping, murmured Ern. Like scales, said Simony. Ern looked reflectively at the card. A tortoise, he said. And the battering ram, said Simony. Oh, that's no problem, said Ern, not paying much attention. A tree trunk bolted to the frame, big iron rammer. Hmm, they're only bronze doors, you say. Uh, yes, but they're very big. Uh, then they're probably hollow or cast bronze plates on wood. Hmm. That's what I do. Not solid bronze. Everyone says they're solid bronze. Eh, that's what I'd say, too. Excuse me, sirs. A burly man stepped forward. He wore the uniform of the palace guards. Ah, this is Sir Fergman, said Simony. Yes, sergeant. The doors is reinforced with Kalachian steel because of all the fighting in the time of the false prophet Zog. And they only and they open the outwards only like lock gates on the canal you understand if you push on them they only locks more firmly together uh, how are they open then said Ern. Mm, the cenobiarch raises his hand and the breath of god blows them open said the sergeant in a logical sense i meant oh well one of the deacons goes behind a curtain and pulls a lever but when i was on guard down in the crypts sometimes there was a room um, there were gratings and things. Well, you could hear water gushing. Ah, hydraulics, said Ern. Thought it would be hydraulics. Uh, can you get in, said Simony? To the room? <laughs> Why not? No one bothers with it. Could he make the doors open, said Simony? Hmm? Ern was rubbing his chin reflectively with his hammer. He seemed to be lost in a world of his own. Hmm... I said, could Fergman make these hydraulics work? Mm, oh, shouldn't think so, said Ern vaguely. Could you? What? Could you make them work? No, oh, probably. It's just pipes and pressures, after all. Um. Ern was still staring thoughtfully at the steam cart. Simony nodded meaningfully to the, at the sergeant, indicating that he should go away, and then tried the mental interplanetary journey necessary to get whatever world... Oh... Yeah, whatever world Ern was in. He tried looking at the cart, too. How soon can you have it all finished? Hmm? I said, uh, late tomorrow night, if we work through tonight. But we'll need it for the next dawn. We won't have time to see if it works. It'll work the first time, said Ern. Really? I built it. I know about it. You know about swords and spears and things. I know about things that go round and round. It will work the first time. Good. Well, there are other things I've got to do. Right. Ern was left alone in the barn. He looked reflectively at his hammer and then at the iron cart. They didn't know how to cast bronze properly here. Their iron was pathetic. Just pathetic. Their coppers? Oh, it was terrible. They seemed to be able to make steel that shattered at a blow. Over the years, the Quisition had weeded out all the goodsmiths. He'd done just the best he could, but... Just don't ask me about the second or third time, he said quietly to himself. Vorbis sat in the stone chair in his garden, paper strewn around him. 
Well? The kneeling figure did not look up. Two guards stood over it with drawn swords. Um, the turtle people, uh, the plot, people are plotting something. It was the voice, it was a voice shrill with terror. <laughs> of course they are, of course they are, said Vorbis. And what is this plot? Uh, there's some kind of, uh, when you're confirmed as Cenobarch, uh, some kind of device, some machine that goes by itself. It'll smash down the doors of the temple. The voice faded away. And where is this device now? Said Vorbis. I don't know. They brought iron, or they bought iron from me. That's all I know. An iron device. Yes, the man took deep breath, half breath, half gulp. People say, the guards said, you have my father in prison. You might, I plead. Vorbis looked down at the man. But you fear, he said, that I might have you thrown in the cells as well. You think I am that sort of person. Your fear, you fear that I may think this man has associated with heretics and blasphemers in familiar circumstances. The man continued to stare fixedly at the ground. Vorbis's fingers curled gently around his chin and raised his head until they were eye to eye. What you have done is a good thing, he said. He looked at one of the guards. Is this man's father still alive? Uh, yes, Lord. Still capable of walking? The Inquisitor shrugged. Yes, Lord? Then release him this instant, put him in the charge of his dutiful son here, and send them both back home. The armies of hope and fear fought in the informant's eyes. Thank you, Lord, he said. Go in peace. Vorbis watched one of the guards escort the man from the garden. Then he waved a hand vaguely at one of the head inquisitors. Do we know where he lives? Uh, yes, Lord. Good. The inquisitor hesitated. And this uh, device, Lord? Om has spoken to me. A machine that goes by itself? Such a thing is against all reason. Where are its muscles? Where is its mind? Yes, Lord. The Inquisitor, whose name was Deacon Cusp, had got where he was today, which is a place he wasn't sure right now that he wanted to be, because he liked hurting people. It was a simple desire, and one that was satisfied in abundance within the Quisition. And he was one of those who was terrified in a very particular way by Vorbis. Hurting people because you enjoyed it, that was understandable. Vorbis just hurt people because he decided that they should be hurt, without passion, even with a kind of hard love. In Cusp's experience, people didn't make things up, ultimately. Not in front of an Exquisitor. Of course, there were no such things as devices that moved by themselves, but he made a mental note to increase the guard. However, said Vorbis, there will be a disturbance during the ceremony tomorrow. Lord, I have special knowledge, said Vorbis. Of course, Lord. You know the breaking strain of sinews and muscles, Deacon Cusp. Cusp had formed an opinion that Vorbis was somewhere on the other side of madness. Ordinary madness he could deal with. In his experience, there were quite a lot of mad people in the world, and many of them became even more insane in the tunnels of the Quisition. But Vorbis had passed right through that red barrier and had built some kind of logical structure on the other side. Rational thoughts made out of insane components. Uh, yes, Lord, he said. I know the breaking strain of people. It was night and cold for this time of year. Lutzi crept through the gloom of the barn, sweeping industriously. Sometimes he took a rag from the recesses of his robe and polished things. He polished the outside of the moving turtle, which loomed low and menacing in the shadows. And he swept his way toward the forge, where he watched it for a while. It takes extreme concentration to pour good steel. No wonder gods have always clustered around isolated smithies. There are so many things that could go wrong. A slight mismix of ingredients, a moment's lapse. Ern, who was almost asleep on his feet, grunted as he was nudged awake and something was put in his hands. It was a cup of tea. He looked into the little round face of Lut Z. Oh, he said. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Nod, smile. Nearly done, said Ern, more or less to himself. Just gotta let it cool now. Gotta let it cool really slowly, otherwise it crystallizes, you see. Nod, smile, nod. It was good tea. 
It's not important to cast anyways, said Ern, swaying. Just the control levers. Lutzi caught him carefully and steered him to a seat on a heap of charcoal. Then he went and watched the forge for a while. The bar of steel glow, glowing in the mold. He poured a bucket of cold water over it, watching the great cloud of steam spread and disperse, then put his broom over his shoulder and ran away hurriedly. People to whom Lut Zee was a vaguely glimpsed figure behind a very slow broom would have been surprised at his turn of speed, especially in a man 6,000 years old who ate nothing but brown rice and drank only green tea with a knob of rancid butter in it. A little ways away from the Citadel main gates, he stopped running and started sweeping. He swept up to the gates, swept around the gates themselves, nodded and smiled at a soldier who glared at him, and then realized it was only a daft old sweeper, polished one of the handles of the gates, and swept his way by the passages and cloisters to Brutha's vegetable garden. He could see a figure crouched among the melons. Lutzi found a rug and padded out back in the garden, where Brutha was sitting hunched up with his hoe over his knees. Lutzi had seen many agonized faces in his times, which was a longer time than most whole civilization managed to see. Brutha's was the worst. He tugged the rug over the bishop's shoulders. I can't hear him, said Brutha hoarsely. It may mean that he's too far away. I, I keep on thinking that. He might be out there somewhere, miles away. Lutzi smiled and nodded. It'll happen all over again. He never told anyone to do anything, or not to do anything. He didn't care. Lutzi nodded and smiled again. His teeth were yellow. There were, in fact, his 200th set. He should have cared. Lutzi disappeared into his corner again and returned with a shallow bowl full of some kind of tea. He nodded and smiled and proffered it until Bertha took it and had a sip. It tasted like hot water with a lavender bag in it. You don't understand anything I'm talking about, do you, said Brutha. Not much, said Lutzi. You can talk? Lutzi put a wizened finger to his lips. Big secret. Brutha looked at the little man. How did he know about him? How much did anyone know about him? You talk to God, said Lutzi. Ha! How do you know that? Signs. Men who talk to God have difficult life. You're right, Brutha stared at Lutzi over the cup. Why are you here, he said. You're not Omnian, or Ephibian. Grew up near Hub, long time ago. Now Lutzi a stranger everywhere he goes. Best way, learn religion and temple at home. Now go where job is. Parting soil and pruning plants here? Sure, never been bishop or high pandrum. Dangerous life. Always be man who cleans pews or sweeps up behind altar. No one bother useful man. No one bother small man. No one remember name. That's what I was gonna do, but it doesn't work for me. Then find other way. I learn in temple, taught by ancient master. When trouble, always remember wise words of ancient and venerable master. Uh, what were they? Ancient master say, that boy there, what you eating? Hope you bought enough for everybody. Ancient master say, you bad boy, why you no do, ho no do homework? Ancient master say, what boy laughing? No tell what boy laughing, whole dojo staying after school. When remember these wise words, nothing seems so bad. What shall I do? I can't hear him. You do what you must. I learn anything. It, you have to walk it all alone. Rutha hugged his knees. But he told me nothing. Where's all this wisdom? All the other prophets came back with commandments. Where they get them? I suppose they make them up. You get them from same place. Ooh. You call this philosophy? Roared Didactylos, waving his stick. Ern cleared clean pieces of sand mold from the lever. Well, natural philosophy, he said. The stick wanged down on the moving turtle's flanks. I never taught you this sort of thing, shouted the philosopher. Philosophy is supposed to make life better. This will make life better for a lot of people, said Ern calmly. It will help overthrow a tyrant. And then, said Didactylos, and then what? And then you'll take it to bits, will you, said the old man. Smash it off, take the wheels off, get rid of all those spikes, burn the plans, yes, when it's served its purpose, yes. 
Well, Ern began. Aha! Aha, what? What if we do keep it? It'll be a, a deterrent to other tyrants. You think other tyrants won't build them too? Well, I can build bigger ones, Ern shouted. The dactylus sagged. Yes, he said. No doubt you can. So that's all right then. My word, and to think I was worrying. And now I think I'll go and have a rest somewhere. He looked hunched up and suddenly old. M master? Don't master me, said Didactylos, feeling his way along the barn walls to the door. I can see you know every bloody thing there is to know about human nature now. Ha! The great god Alm slid down the side of an irrigation ditch and landed on his back in the weeds at the bottom. He righted himself by gripping a root with his mouth and hauling himself over. The shape of Brutha's thoughts flickered back and forth in his mind. He couldn't make out any actual words, but he didn't need to, any more than you need to see the ripples to know which way the river flowed. Occasionally, when he could see the citadel as a gleaming dot in the twilight, he'd try shouting his own mind back as loudly as he could. Wait, 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 you don't want to do that? We can go to Ankhmapork, land of opportunity. With my brains and your... Uh, with you, the world is our mollusk. Why throw it all away? And then he'd slide into another furrow. Once or twice he saw the eagle forever circling. Why put your hand into the grinder? This place deserves Vorbis. Sheep deserve to be led. It had been like this when his very first believer had been stoned to death. Of course, by then he had dozens of other believers. But it had been a wrench. It had been upsetting. You never forget your first believer. They gave you shape. Tortoises are not well equipped for cross-country navigation. They need longer legs or shallower ditches. Om estimated that he was doing less than a fifth of a mile an hour in a direct line, and the citadel was at least 20 miles away. Occasionally, he made good time between trees in an olive grove, but that was more than pulled back by the rocky ground in the field walls. All the time, as his legs whirred, Brutha's thoughts buzzed in his head like a distant bee. He tried shouting into his mind again. What have you got? He's got an army. You've got an army? How many divisions you've got? But thoughts like that needed energy, and there was a limit to the amount of energy available in one tortoise. He found a bunch of fallen grapes and gobbled them until juice covered his head, but it didn't make a lot of difference. And then there was nightfall. Nights here weren't as cold as the desert, but they weren't as warm as the day. He'd slow down and at night as his blood cooled. He wouldn't be able to think as fast, or walk as fast. He was losing heat already. Heat meant speed. He pulled himself onto another anthill. You're going to die! You're going to die! And slid down to the other side. Preparations for the inauguration of the Cenobiarch Prophet began many hours before dawn. Firstly, and not according to ancient tradition, there was a very careful search of the temple by Deacon Cusp and some of his colleagues. There was a prowling for tripwires and a poking of odd corners for hidden archers. Although it was against the thread, Deacon Cusp had his head screwed on. He also sent a few squads into town to round up the usual suspects. The Quisition always found it advisable to leave a few suspects at large. Then you knew where to find them when you needed them. After that, a dozen lesser priests arrived to shrive the premises and drive out all Afrites, jinns, and devils. Deacon Cusp watched them without comment. He'd never had any personal dealings with supernatural entities, but he knew what a well-placed arrow would do to an unexpecting stomach. Someone tapped him on the ribcage. He gasped at the sudden linkage of real life to the chain of thought and reached instinctively for his, da his dagger. Oh, he said. Lutzi nodded and smiled and indicated with his broom that Deacon Cusp was standing on a patch of floor that he, Lutzi, wished to sweep. Hello, you ghastly little yellow fool, said Deacon Cusp. Nod, smile. Never say a bloody word, do you? Said Deacon Cusp. Smile, smile. Idiot. Smile, smile. Watch. Ern stood back. Now, he said, uh, you sure you got it all? Easy, said Simony, who was sitting in the turtle saddle. Tell me again. We stoke up the firebox, said Simony. Then when the red needle points to 26, turn the brass tap. When the bronze whistle blows, pull the big lever and steer by pulling the ropes. Right, said Ern, but he still looked doubtful. 
It's a precision device, he said. And I am a professional soldier, said Simony. I'm not a superstitious peasant. Fine, fine. Well, if you're sure. They'd had time to put a few finishing touches to the moving turtle. There were serrated edges to the shell and spikes on the wheels. And, of course, the waste steam pipe. He was a little uncertain about the waste steam pipe. It's merely a device, said Simon. It does not present a problem. <sighs> Give us an hour, then. You should just get to the temple by the time we open the doors. Right, understood. Off you go, Sergeant Fergman knows the way. Ern looked at the steam pipe and bit his lip. I don't know what effect it's going to have on the enemy, he thought, but it scares the hells out of me. Rutha woke up, or at least ceased to trying to sleep. Lutzi had gone, perhaps sweeping somewhere. He wandered through the desert, desert corridors of the novice section. It would be hours before the new Cenobi arch was crowned. There were dozens of ceremonies to be undertaken first. Everyone who was anyone would be in the palace and the surrounding piazzas, and so would even greater number of people who were, were no one very much. The Sestinas were empty, the endless prayers left unsung. The Citadel might have been dead if not for the not for the huge, indefinable background roar of tens of thousands of people being silent. Sunlight filtered down through the light wells. Rutha had never felt more alone. The wilderness had been a feast of fun compared to this. Last night, last night with Lutzi, it all seemed so clear. Last night, he had been in a mood to confront Vorbis, there and then. Last night, there seemed to be a chance. Anything was possible last night. That was the trouble with last night's. They were always followed by this morning's. He wandered out into the kitchen level, and then out into the outside world. There were one or two cooks around, preparing the ceremonial meal of meat, bread, and salt, but they paid him no attention at all. He sat down outside of one of the slaughterhouses. There was, he knew, a black gate somewhere around, or back gate, sorry. Probably no one would stop him today if he walked out. Today they would be looking for unwanted people walking in. He could just walk away. The wilderness had seemed quite pleasant, apart from the thirst and hunger. St. Un Saint Ungelant, with his madness and his mushrooms, seemed to have a life exactly right. It didn't matter if you fooled yourself, provided you didn't let yourself know it, and did it well. Life was so much simpler in the desert. But there were dozens of guards by the gate. They had an unsympathetic look. He went back to his seat, which was tucked away in a corner, and stared gloomily at the ground. If Ulm was alive, surely he could send a sign. A grating by Brutha's sandals lifted itself up a few inches and slid aside. He stared at the hole. A hooded head appeared and stared back, and disappeared again. There was a subterranean whispering. The head reappeared and was followed by a body. It pulled itself onto the cobbles. The hood was pushed back. The man grinned conspiratorially at Brutha, put his finger to his lips, and then, without warning, launched himself at him with violent intent. Brutha rolled across the cobbles and raised his hands frantically as he saw the gleam of metal. One filthy hand clamped against his mouth. The knife blade made a dramatic and fi very final silhouette against the light. No! Why not? We said the first thing we'll do, and we'll kill all priests. Not that one! Brutha dared to swivel his eyes sideways. Although the second figure was rising from the hole was also wearing a filthy robe, there was no mistaking the paintbrush hairstyle. He tried to say, Urn? Shut up, you, said the other man, pressing the knife to his throat. Brutha, said Urn, y you're alive? Brutha moved his eyes from his captor to Urn in a way which he had hoped would indicate that it was too soon to make any commitment on this point. He's all right, said Ern. All right, he's a priest. But he's on the, our side, aren't you, Brutha? Brutha tried to nod and thought, I'm on everyone's side. It'd be nice if, just for once, someone was on mine. The hand unclamped from his mouth, but the knife remained resting on his throat. Brutha's normally careful thought processes ran like quicksilver. The turtle moves, he ventured. The knife was withdrawn with obvious reluctance. I don't trust him, said the man. We should shove him in the hole, at least. Brutha's one of us, said Ern. That's right, that's right, said Brutha. Uh, which ones are you? Ern leaned closer. How's your memory? Unfortunately, it's fine. Good, good. Uh, it would be a good idea to stay out of trouble, do you hear? If anything happens, remember the turtle. Well, of course you would. What things? 
Ern patted him on the shoulder, making Bruthith think for a moment of Vorbis. Vorbis, who never touched another person inside his head, was a great toucher with his hands. Best if you don't know what's happening, said Ern. But I don't know what's happening, said Brutha. Good, that's the way. The burly man gestured with his knife towards the tunnels that led into the rock. Are we going or what, he demanded. Ern ran after him and then stopped briefly and turned. Uh, be careful, he said. We need what's in your head. Brutha watched them go. Uh, so do I, he murmured. And then he was alone again. But he thought, hold on. I don't have to be. I'm a bishop. I can at least watch. Alm's gone and soon the world will end, so I might as well watch it happen. Sandals flapping, Brutha set off towards the place. Bishops move diagonally. That's why they often turn up where kings don't expect them to be. You god-awful idiot! Don't go that way! The sun was well up now. In fact, it was probably setting, if Didactylos' theories about the speed of light were correct. But in manners of relativity, the point of view of the observer is very important. And from Alm's point of view, the sun was a golden ball in a flaming orange sky. He pulled himself on another slope and stared blearily at the distant citadel. In his mind's eye, he could hear the mocking voices of all the small gods. They didn't like a god who had failed. They didn't like that at all. It let them all down. It reminded them of mortality. He'd be thrust out in the deep desert, where no one would ever come, ever, until the end of the world. He shivered in his shell. I think that's actually where I'm going to stop tonight. That's at page 295. Yeah. I think the let I, I think I'll just read a little bit longer for the next reading. So we only have about like 50 more pages. But yeah. We're coming up on the conclusion and things are, are really coming to a head. So I hope to see you guys soon. I'll I'll try to get the next reading out in the a couple of days and like I said I'll finish up and then I'll figure out the next book that I want to do. But yeah, once again, thank you guys so much for the support and for being around and for enjoying this reading of Terry Pratchett's Small Gods. I will see you all soon.